Hello, everybody, and welcome back to A House Divided. My name is Bjorn Skaftesen, and I am coming to you today from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. We always come from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago, but today you see me coming to you from our studio, our live studio. Our guest today has been in this studio before, back in the uh, before times uh, when um, he could actually come and visit us in Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. Uh, but he's with us today remotely from somewhere in the vicinity of Adamsville, Tennessee. And uh, our guest is Tim, Tim Smith, Dr. Tim Smith, author of The Siege at Vicksburg. And I'm going to wave it in front of the camera for <laughs> folks at home. Uh, the Siege at Vicksburg is, let me my notes out here, climax of the campaign to open the Mississippi River, May 23rd to July 4th, 1863, published by University Press of Kansas, 724 pages. Let's look at, that's a pretty <laughs> fat book there, Tim. You can use it for a doorstop. You can use it for a doorstop uh, after, you're, after you're done reading it. Yeah. Uh, 724 pages, the cost is $45. Now, I also want, before we even dive into this, to let anybody who's watching this know that the Siege of Vicksburg is part of a series. And at the moment, you have two books in that series that are options for you. The second one is the Union Assaults at Vicksburg, Grant Attacks Pemberton, May 17 through 22, 1863. Also from University Press of Kansas, 483 pages, $34.95, we have both of them in stock at this time. Tim, uh, this is developing into a series of books about Vicksburg. Can you explain uh, exactly what the series is going to look like by the time you're done? Sure. Um, uh, it's going to be a five-volume series, which uh, I struggled a little bit with how I wanted to do this. I, I knew several aspects of the Vicksburg campaign needed standalone books. For instance, the um, uh, the assaults needed its own book. Uh, Mike Ballard, our friend uh, Mike Ballard, who sadly passed away not long ago, uh, right. preached forever the need for a book on the Mississippi Central Chickasaw Bio campaign. And so I've just finished that manuscript, in fact, and sent it off to the publisher, and it's out, as I understand it, for peer review right now. Um, so that'll be its own volume, which will actually, and I never do these things, I don't think ahead enough to to do these things in order when i did the the um, tennessee river trilogy uh, i did them completely backwards uh, i should have started fort henry and donaldson and then done shallow and then corinth but i started with yeah. corinth and then did shallow and then fort henry and donaldson but um when i originally started this the idea was to i wanted to do the assaults um and then the logical idea was just go on and, and do a book on the siege um and then i thought well why not go ahead and do the, the whole thing? Um, not trying to compete with Ed Bars at all. I uh, mm -hmm. wanted it to be different than, than Ed's series of three volumes, of course. So this, this will be right. five. Um, obviously not trying to replace Ed's work, not trying to compete with him at all. He laid the foundation for all of us studying Vicksburg. Uh, but at the same time, you know, that was written uh, 60 years ago, published, what, 40 years ago now? Mm -hmm. um, and there's some new stuff that's come out, new uh, material that's that's been uh, located, and you can do a lot more research now, and so on. So I think it's time for a new a new treatment. Again, not trying to replace anybody or or anything like that, but I think it's time high time for a new treatment on on Vicksburg. So. Right, I certainly agree with you there, Tim, uh, because your access to uh, material is. Uh, many, many times greater in 2021 than in the 1960s when, you know, Edwin Cole Bars was sitting in Vicksburg, and if he couldn't put his hand on a piece of paper or open a book and read it right there, uh, that, you know, that was sort of the limitations to his primary right. sources. Now you work, all of us work in this digital world, uh, also in a world where it's a little easier to get around physically, where we can right. really see a lot more stuff, right? Right, you're exactly right. And archives are wonderful. Uh, even if you can't go to all the different archives of, of 
now scanning material and, and emailing it or Dropbox or, or something. So uh, it, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier uh, today, obviously. Right, right. Um, so at this point, I can see that we have two of the books published. You, you envision five. Uh, we've got the assaults and we've got the siege. I know there's probably going to be one on the great 17 day campaign from Bruinsburg to Vicksburg. Um, right. and, but then what else, what else are you looking for that involves a book length treatment? Well, uh, what the two volumes that we've got today are ultimately going to be volume four and five in the, in the series. Uh, okay. The one I just turned in, I went back and started with number one. Now when I decided to do a series, um, the Chickasaw Bio uh, Mississippi Central Campaign, which will encompass uh, Forest West Tennessee Raid, Van Doren's Raid on Holly Springs, all of that. Um, that will run from October or so, 1862, to the end of the year, December 31st, which is when Parker's Crossroads uh, is fought, kind of ending ending the uh, the campaign, that part of the campaign. Uh, okay. So that will be volume one. Then I will do uh, volume two, and I'm just starting to kind of, I've taken a break doing a biography right now, um, but I've just started kind of gearing up to do uh, what will be volume two, which will be the uh, the canals, Lake Providence, Yazoo Pass, uh, Chicks, or, or um, uh, Steele's Bio, uh, even Grierson's Raid, all of the, all of the passage of the, the Vicksburg batteries and all of that, uh, right. roughly from January 1st to the end of April. Um, will be that volume. And then uh, the middle volume, the third volume leading up to the assaults, of course, uh, will indeed be uh, pretty much, I've thought about a little bit ahead of how I want to do this, and I may just take it day by day. You know, start with May the 1st with, um, with Fort Gibson, and then May the 2nd, May the 3rd, you know, do a chapter kind of uh, each day, which will uh, obviously not, I've written a book on Champion Hill, and it won't provide mm -hmm. nearly the depth um, that I went into in, with the, the volume on Champion Hill, uh, but it'll put it into probably a little bit larger context of the day-by-day -day, uh, in, inland campaign there um, so that readers, you know, that, that read the series and want even more about um, Champion Hill, for instance, or Grierson's Raid, they can go to those specific books uh, to give a, a lot more detail on, the, on those specific events. Right. It, once you end up with the five volume series, there will be at least three volumes of Tim Smith writing that will be available as an adjunct to those series. One would be the, right. the Real Horse Soldiers, Gerson's Raid book. Another would be uh, the analysis of Grant's uh, command. Mm -hmm. The decision was always my own. And then, of course, the Champion Hill book that you wrote some time ago. All right. Yeah. Well, wonderful. It means that we've got a lot to look forward to. And, and I would say this, let's get the fat book back out again. Uh, and I'm going to bother Tim about this in a minute. You know, this is the size of a book where people have been telling us for 50 or 60 years that nothing happened. <laughs> During the siege. Right? Yeah. I mean, how many chapters from books have you read where Grant assaults Vicksburg, and it doesn't work out, and then one paragraph later, Pemberton is surrendering. Yeah, just just starve them out. Wait, wait for wait for it all to collapse. So yeah, as if as if everybody just sat there staring at each other for the right. entire time. Yeah. And what the siege of Vicksburg tells us is absolutely not. There's a couple of things in there. One, a siege, any siege, is not a static operation. Uh, both. The besieged and the besieging people are always, always trying something. Uh, they're not just sitting on their hands. And the Vicksburg siege is a perfect example exactly. of that. And then also uh, the other aspect, which is going to be important to this book, and we'll talk about it later, is nobody who is being besieged wants to see that army lost. So whoever runs that army is going to try to help them. And that is going you to would, open you would think, of, the, of, of Vicksburg, the second front, right? Right. Yeah. You would think they would try to help, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you would think they would try harder. Yeah. Yeah, really. <laughs> but you know what? Let's, I want to jump into the, some of the questions I've prepared for you, Tim. Okay. Um, All right. So that people can sort of see why a, why a book like this needs so much material to get to the story. 
so let's start at um, uh, at the end of the first. I was going to say the first book at the end of the fourth book in the series, the, the, the assaults. The assaults have failed. Grant did not get into Vicksburg. Pemberton did save the city. He does have time. So how did Grant immediately, immediately respond to the failure of the assault, of the assaults? What was the next thing? Well, Grant is highly agitated. And in fact, I start the book talking about things aren't going right for anybody. Confederates uh, inside Vicksburg, Confederates outside Vicksburg, Grant uh, looking at taking Vicksburg. Nobody's happy with the, the situation. Uh, but Grant realizes immediately, okay, no more of these assaults. We're, we're not going to, um, we're not going to, you know, waste any more lives for men. And I really don't think he was wasting them. I think he had um, perfect legitimacy to, to try the, uh, the both assaults, actually. Uh, but Grant very quickly realizes this is not going to work. The topography, the terrain, the defenses are just too strong uh, for assaults from, you know, hundreds of yards out. Uh, we have to begin siege operations. And um, the idea there is, he later talks about in his memoirs, of course, we'll either starve them out if they, if they run out of food or ammunition. Uh, but the more important um, logical idea and what really actually works eventually uh, is to basically dig their way to the, the Confederate fortifications through the use of uh, approaches, through the use of saps and parallels and all those siege terms, um, and basically dig their way up to the Confederate works so that then one of two things can happen. Number one, uh, you can either assault from a much closer position. You know, if you have to cover hundreds of yards of, of territory uh, attacking the Confederate works, you'll be shot down in the in the process. Uh, but if you only have like 15 seconds worth of, of movement to get to those Confederate works and over them, uh, you're gonna have a lot better chance of, of breaching the wall. So uh, the assault is always in the back of Grant's mind. In fact, he has it scheduled for July the 6th. Uh, of course, Vicksburg capitulates from July the 4th. Uh, the other option, when you get that close to the Confederate works, is to start mining operations and to dig under the Confederate works and to to blast holes in the uh, in the enemy fortifications, which then can be uh, coordinated with additional assaults, of course, and make it that much easier. Similar to what we hear so much about at Petersburg, of course, uh, but Vicksburg is a year ahead of Petersburg. Had the same exact uh, mining operations, blowing holes in the in the enemy lines and and assaults, you know, through the um, through the, the craters and, and all that kind of stuff. So Petersburg kind of, because it's in the East, Robert E. Lee and all that, uh, gets a lot of the, the attention, but it was happening a year before at, at Vicksburg. So Grant realizes very quickly, we've got to turn to these siege operations. And in fact, they start the very next day, May the 23rd. Orders, specific orders to start the siege operations don't uh, go out until actually May the 25th, but um, unofficially, uh, siege operations, uh, the digging and so on begins as early as May the 23rd. Okay. Well, then this puts, um, to some extent, this puts Grant's engineers in the driver's seat next, right? Well, there again, you would think so as well, but the problem is Grant doesn't have many engineers. Uh, okay. In fact, uh, uh, there's a book about um, the union engineering process, Solnik, um, who uh, engineered Victory, I believe. There's two books named Engineering mm -hmm. Victory. But anyway, it, oh, uh, it, wrote that. Very good yeah, book. yeah. Um, it deals with the the Union siege operations, which is not a it's a very good book, but it's not a complete history of the of the siege, not a complete examination of the siege. Right. Um, and I lean on his book a good bit in in dealing particularly with the technical engineering aspects and and so on. But um, one of the things that he brings out and is is evident in the in the records. Uh, is that Grant is hard pressed for engineers. He just doesn't have many at all. Uh, just a couple of engineers actually uh, on the staff and the army wide staff and, and so on to oversee all of this, this, uh, these operations. And in fact, what he has to do is adapt, of course, and that will even force a lot of the West Point trained generals in command of divisions and even brigades and certainly corps um, to kind of do collateral duties to to have collateral duties in terms of uh, of engineering and laying out saps and approaches and, and all of that 
Uh, in fact, you get the great story of Sherman wandering on this this uh, brigade detail um, and asking them what they're doing. They say, well, we're here to, we're making fascines or gabions or something like that. And he said, do you know what you're doing? Have you ever heard of those? And he said, we just joined the army. We don't, we don't know, have any idea what we're doing. And so he gets off his horse and he starts showing them how to, to do this. Some of the things that he had learned back in the engineering training at, at, uh, at West Point. So Grant's grabbing engineers from any place that he can. And some of those get sick throughout the siege and have to be replaced. Uh, he even uh, talks about, a well, humorous example, putting uh, some of his, uh, his staff officers in the roles of engineers. And I believe this is commissary general uh, tells him, you know, the only thing I would be good for in terms of engineering is as a sap roller, which is a big bundle of cane that you use to, to block enemy fire, basically. And uh, he's a he's a big fat fella. And uh, he's making the joke that that all he would be good for is is to be used as a sap roller. So sap uh, roller, Grant yeah. lets him off the lets him off the hook there. So but yeah, he's in good. need of well, at least he kept everybody fed, right? Yeah, well, Grant, that's what Grant says is the army needs to be fed. I'll let you off the hook. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, other side of the coin, uh, you know, uh, in the certainly in the assault book, you introduced us to Samuel Lockett and the work he did developing the land defenses of right. Vicksburg or Pemberton. Does he continue actively engineering into the siege? Yes. Uh, most of his work, of course, is done beforehand, uh, laying out the Confederate siege lines and the defenses and so on. Uh, but there is a lot of engineering that still has to be done during the siege itself because every day these Confederate siege lines are absolutely pummeled with uh, Union fire from artillery and gunboats and mortars and, and everything else. And every night the Confederates have to, to, to redo these fortifications and rebuild them, basically and uh, dig just a little bit deeper and, and so on. So there's a lot of engineering uh, that has to, has to be done. Uh, and part of what Lockett is doing is what he called retrenchments or um, fortifications across the angles of the, the rear parts of forts. For instance, if you have a redan, a V-shaped redan, um, instead of just manning that redan, he would, he would uh, dig trenches along the base uh, or the open part of the V of the Redan in order to, to give kind of a second line that, that you could fall back to. Very similar to what we see at Spotsylvania with a mule shoe. When, um, when the Union forces break through with the mule shoe there, Lee has another line that he can fall back at the base of the mule shoe. And, uh, and Lockett will, over the course of the siege, provide these as well. And it comes in handy, particularly on the 25th, when uh, the Union forces blow that mine at the 3rd Louisiana Redan, and right. the Confederates are able to hold the line because of that. Mm -hmm. Now, what you're what you're saying here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna step back for a minute, uh, and again to try to frame the story in contrast to what we may think or what we probably think, if our exposure to the Vicksburg siege has just been through that one paragraph or so uh, in a in a larger book, we might think that the Vicksburg, that Lockett's entrenchments were impregnable and that Grant just could not destroy them. But in fact, what we find in your book, especially when you look at, you mentioned it with Lockett's work, ongoing work, is that the Union artillery was very effective at pounding down those uh, breastworks. And Vicksburg was only impregnable if you want to use that term, to the extent that the Confederate infantry could continue to rebuild them every night. Am I right, right. about that? Yes, you, you absolutely are. And that's what eventually leads to the surrender. Um, you know, there's arguments that, that Grant starved the Confederates out. That didn't happen. They, they had several days worth, at least four or five days worth of food uh, left in Vicksburg. So the surrender comes at the end kind of of the of the usable portion of the food, not the reserve that they that they still have. Uh, so they could have held out several more days with, with the food at the rate they were issuing it, which was small, of course, at, at the time. Um, there's also argument- right, They're still they hungry. Even, do what? They were still hungry, yeah, but they had yeah, food, right? Yeah, yeah they had food. Um, also the argument that they ran out of ammunition. Um, that's, that's not the case. Grant found tons and tons of ammunition, again, largely in reserve. Um, mm -hmm. But Solnit makes the point, and I, I totally agree and, and uh, flesh it out a little bit more in, in this book, um, 
that the Union forces were dug out uh, of Vicksburg, rather, or the Confederate forces were dug out rather than starved out, uh, mm -hmm. and in large part because of the pummeling of these Confederate earthworks over and over and over, eventually you don't have a whole lot to work with because every day when it's when these earthworks are shot down, um, you have to rebuild, and every day you go a little bit deeper. You, you just dig your trenches a little bit deeper in whatever hillside that you're working with, and eventually you're going to run out of hillside. And um, in fact, in the um, in the deliberations about uh, surrender and so on, uh, Lockett and others reported to the commanders that uh, the works, particularly on the Graveyard Road and the Jackson Road, are just in miserable shape, and we're running out of any ability to refashion those uh, and to make them impregnable. Um, so no, Vicksburg is absolutely not impregnable uh, over time. Maybe on May the 19th and 22nd to, to long range assaults, yes. Um, but over the course of the time, and I have no doubt whatsoever that the assault on July the 6th would have been easily successful, probably in just a matter of minutes. Right, right. Um, and we might get to, we might come back to that in a minute. But I do want to, to look at some other, um, uh, some other things, some other activities that are not front and center, but within the context of a siege are incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Confederates are hungry all the way through it. But at the end of the assaults, the Federals are quite hungry themselves at that moment. And Grant's first and most important uh, crisis, I guess. Well, I'll let you just determine what's a good crisis or an important crisis or not. But one of the first things he has to do is establish that supply line. He didn't march all the way through Mississippi con with convoys and wagons uh, with the ability to do a siege. Somehow he had to establish that supply line. And so tell us about how he managed to do that. Where is the supply line? And how do those beans and bullets eventually come up and get to Grant's troops? Right. Well, the, the key stroke or the key um, unlocking the, the, with the key, as Lincoln would have put it, uh, comes on May 17, 18, 19-ish, uh, before the assaults, of course. But as Grant moves forward, he's crossed the Big Black River on the 17th and early on the 18th. Uh, and he moves forward and he takes Haynes Bluff and Snyder's Bluff. And they don't get nearly enough attention, I don't think, in, in a lot of Vicksburg studies. Um, but when Grant takes those bluffs and the Chickasaw Bio area, the former battlefield there, uh, and opens up connection with the Yazoo River um, to, the, to the north, which connects with the Mississippi River north of Vicksburg. It's not under, under Confederate fire, not under uh, Confederate forces. Um, that then opens up, of course, this, this great line of supply. Uh, and, su of course, it takes a, l a few days, a, a little while for it to start funneling in. Uh, but eventually, Grant has tons and tons of reinforcements coming through this, this uh, uh, area. Uh, supplies, ammunition, food, you name it, um, comes in through the, the, the supply depots there at Chickasaw Bio, just, just um, downriver from, from Haynes Bluff and Snyder's Bluff. So that's really the, the keystroke of the campaign. That's when Grant almost um, has the, you know, we've talked about Champion Hills, the decisive battle for Vicksburg, and in the fighting uh, between the two sides, yes, it is. But when Grant really has Vicksburg by the throat is when he opens up this, this, new, this new supply line. And we see this in, in uh, Sherman's uh, actions and, and uh, rhetoric when, uh, you know, they talk about, when Sherman and Grant finally ride to the bluffs overlooking the Chickasaw battle bio battlefield where Sherman had been defeated uh, six months earlier and, and all that, Sherman makes this great speech about, you know, this is a victory whether we take Vicksburg or not. The campaign has been a success. I didn't have any faith in it, but, but yes, it's been a success now that you have this and, and so on. So really in the largest context, Vicksburg the campaign can be looked at in really two different phases. One, the, the opportunity or the, the desire to get to a position to attack and, and take Vicksburg. And then number two, the process of actually taking Vicksburg. Uh, so all of this stuff, Chickasaw Bio, Yazoo Pass, uh, even Grant, you know, marching across the river, Bruinsburg and Champion Hill and all that kind of stuff is an effort, that first effort to just get in a position to 
acquire Vicksburg. Uh, and then once he does that by the 18th and certainly early on the 19th, he begins the process of actually taking Vicksburg, which, con which uh, you know, considers or consists of, of the two assaults and then the, the lengthy siege. So um, that's, that's in the largest contest top context, the, uh, the, the easiest way to understand uh, Vicksburg. So three volumes of this series will be dealing with just getting to Vicksburg and then two right. will be dealing with taking Vicksburg. Right. But certainly, you know, yeah. And opening that, that supply line and, and now it's crucial that the, that the supplies for Grant's army are going to come up the, uh, up the Azu river to Haines Bluff and, and places like that. I want to get back to that in a minute, but we're now, gosh, we're about halfway through our time, Tim. Uh, I, I know how much you like talking about digging holes, and I love listening to stories about digging holes. Uh, just wait until we get to the Grants Canal part of, of that book. Yeah. I yeah. want to talk about that. But let's go to, we have some questions from the folks who are watching. Um, okay. And uh, Mona is watching, and she's a member of the Shiloh, Shiloh Discussion Group. Hey, Mona. And Mona... What's that? I said, hey to Mona. <laughs> oh, yes. Hello, Mona. And uh, Mona wants to know, what of the civilians affected by the siege? Oh, tons of, of uh, uh, civilians affected by the siege. And in fact, I spend a good deal of, of material um, dealing not only with just the, the soldier's experience of what it was like to be in these trenches and the sun bearing down all day um, on you, and then you can't sleep at night because cannonballs are landing all over the place. Um, so I deal with a, a lot of that, but I also deal a lot with the, the civilians, and there's, there's a lot of, of material in that. And inside Vicksburg, there's really two different, um, really three different aspects of the civilians. You've got the civilians inside Vicksburg, of course, that are just getting hammered by these mortar shells and, and uh, living in caves and, and all that, and I, I go into extensive detail on a lot of that. Uh, but then you also have the civilians outside of Vicksburg that are um, in their own way, just as bad off as, uh, or if not worse than the civilians inside Vicksburg, at least you don't have to have a, an enemy army per se to contend with. Uh, if you're living two miles behind Union lines, you're right in the middle of the Union camps and the Union transportation routes and, and um, army headquarters and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so you have to deal with not only um, the, the process of the military fighting, but also you're basically occupied uh, by the enemy at the time, which is something the Vicksburg civilians uh, inside Vicksburg didn't have to deal with. Um, and then a third group of civilians I actually deal a, a little bit with um, are visitors to uh, the Army, particularly the Northern Army. The Southerners mm -hmm. don't get a whole lot of visitors uh, inside yeah. Vicksburg. <laughs> um, but you've, you've got family members, you've got um, sutlers, uh, sanitary commission uh, folks coming down, even entertainers, the Lomb Lombard brothers from Chicago show up and do their singing concerts and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, there are quite a lot of civilians uh, around the Vicksburg operations, and uh, it's a fascinating story in and of itself uh, to look at, at those civilians affected by the war. Right, right. Well, thank you, Mona, for asking that question. And uh, but, it, but the last thing that we talked about with the supplies, Tim, that was leading me into a next question that I wanted to, to ask. And, uh, and in a moment, we're gonna do a shout out to Mary Fincher, who's uh, one of the partners in the uh, Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. Well, there's Mary's shout out right there. But one of the things that, uh, that Mary has discovered in her podcast is she's recently discovered a real affinity for General Nathan Kimball, uh, who's a really yeah. interesting uh, Union general. And right. he shows up, at Vicksburg, and I know simply jumping right into Kimball's exp expedition uh, might be difficult, but could you tell us the context of why this thing known as the slot uh, is so important? Um, I, I think you call it the slot, and yeah. it's, it's this area between Mechanicsburg and the siege lines, which which Grant perceives as a weak point, um, right? And where Confederates might come and relieve Vicksburg. So tell us about these Mechanicsburg expeditions um, and bring us up to General Kimball and his activities. 
Right. Uh, Grant is, is over the course of the siege, almost Mike Ballard used the word paranoid, almost paranoid about his rear. Um, and if, if a besieged army is going to get out of the trap, uh, they have to have a relieving force. Now, unfortunately for the Confederates, that relieving force is under Joe Johnston, who apparently is not going to do anything. But Grant doesn't necessarily know that. Uh, and he's afraid Johnston will do something. And the logical, there are two logical places that something can be done. And that is coming across the Big Black River, uh, basically at the railroad bridge where Grant crossed. Um, but Grant has that from the very start, uh, well defended eventually with Osterhaus's division uh, and others sent out there. Um, the more probable area that any Confederate relief will come from is what I call the slot. Uh, between the Big Black River and the Yazoo River. They parallel each other 10 to 12 or so miles uh, apart, uh, running basically northeast to southwest. And so there's this slot of, of territory, high ground falling off each direction to, to those rivers. Uh, it's very similar kind of to World War II is where I got the, the term, the, the slot, Iron Bottom Sound and all that in the Solomon Islands and the Guadalcanal uh, campaign. Um, but if any uh, Confederate force is going to relieve Vicksburg without fighting its way across the Big Black River at the railroad bridge, um, they'll come down this, this slot of high ground uh, between these two rivers that's just aimed, and we hear a lot of times about the Shenandoah Valley, is, is aimed at, at Washington, D.C. like a shotgun, you know, and that's why the, the Federals were so um, concerned about the Shenandoah Valley, Confederate operations in the Shenandoah Valley. Well, this slot is aimed directly at the rear of Grant's army, and uh, Confederates, um, they think, are going to take advantage of this. And so there's Confederate activity, not a lot. Uh, Johnston never really uh, ventures into this area, uh, never, never crosses the Big Black River per se, anywhere close to, to Grant's army, up farther north around Yazoo City and Canton, he will. But um, there's, there's never really any effort there, but Grant is, is scared to death that there will be. And so he will continually send troops up the slot and up this, this uh, high ground between the two rivers uh, in an effort to protect his rear. And the, the troops are there as more troops come in, uh, some of them under Nathan Kimball, of course. Uh, but what Grant really has trouble is finding a commander who will be able to kind of uh, operate on his own a little bit independently up there, away from, from the, the army itself. He first sends Frank Blair, who gets very scared, um, and then he will send a series of other commanders, uh, including Nathan Kimball. As soon as the division arrives, he sends them right on up uh, Zoe Smith first, and then, and then Nathan Kimball eventually in early June. Uh, finally, Grant says, I'm going up there to take a look myself. And this is when we get this, this famous episode of Grant supposedly being drunk and you know riding through the Union camps and all that, which uh, right, right. has been completely debunked. Um, eventually, uh, this whole rear area, the protection of the rear, uh, will come under the command of the Ninth Corps commander, John Park, who is uh, coming in from Kentucky. Uh, that corps, of course, has been all over the place. Kimball has been in the east, of course, wounded, I believe, at what Antietam or um, I think so. Peninsula. It's been on the peninsula and, and all that. Um, but even, even John Park uh, is not the end all be all. And ultimately, uh, Grant will decide to send Sherman himself. He says, I've got to have somebody that I can trust. And so ultimately, he'll send Sherman himself, relieve him from command of the 15th Corps uh, around the, the, the northern part of the lines at Vicksburg and send him to the rear to command Park and Kimball and, and Washburn and Suey Smith and, and all of these guys, Osterhaus. Um, in, uh, in the rear effort, and ultimately Grant will send up to like 33,000 of his Vicksburg troops out of some 70-something thousand, almost half of his troops back to the rear to cover the rear and to make sure uh, that everything is, is safe back there. So yeah, okay. Kimball's a big, big part of that. Yeah, and, uh, and so, but then also, the, you, you did bring up, and we should, we, we should touch this and because I don't want to skim over the relate if it let's just assume uh, we can assume because of the recent research and what you did that 
the idea of Grant being drunk and going on this big bender and whooping and right is balderdash. It was never, there was never anything to it. But what is, I think, relevant is why this happens. And this brings in some of these reporters and, or, uh, uh, or, or Charles Dana that comes down yeah. from Washington, D.C. And so rather than worrying about is Grant drunk or not, can you talk to us about what this tells us about his relationship with the politicians and with the reporters and the journalists? Well, he does have quite a few around. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, Dana, of course, a newspaper guy that's been sent kind of as a mole from from Washington to check up on Grant. Um, and Grant sees through this very, very clearly. And the old adage of keep your friends close and your enemies closer, he makes him basically a member of his staff and, and wins Dana over. So Dana is sending glowing messages about Grant um, back to Washington. He also has in, in his headquarters, of course, um, Sylvanus uh, Cadwallader, who is a newspaper um, yeah. reporter. And um, most of the newspaper reporters, uh, I think it's Cadwallader, um, says they stay in the plush ladies' cabins of the of the steamboats at Chickasaw Bayou, you know, and the, the nice uh, areas and, and all of that. And they write about what they don't see out there, you know, as, you know, newspaper guys. But anyway, um, it's actually these two, Cadwallader and, and Dana, that um, come up with this story uh, decades later. And significantly, Grant's dead by this point. Uh, but it's only in like the 1880s or 90s or so that uh, they come up with this idea of Grant, you know, being drunk on this on this thing. And, and Will or uh, Dana goes just a little bit um, into it. But uh, it's Cadwallader that just blows the whole thing up, you know, that he's riding through these camps drunk, you know, hooping and hollering and, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, but if you look at the temporary evidence and so on, none of this is is borne out at all. Um, so, right. you know, Grant has a, a good relationship with these guys, but they kind of double cross him a little bit um, after his death, uh, probably for the almighty dollar to, to sell their sell their stories in their books. Possibly, possibly. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's a really interesting. Uh, it, this is one of those things that goes to show that uh, there are some stories that aren't as interesting as they seem, such as the, the drunken story. But they're much more interesting when you ask them why would someone believe that or why would someone write that, right. Right. Um, and that's where you get into some really interesting relationships uh, yep. uh, and the relationships with the media. And Sherman's relationship with the press is going to be <laughs> even more interesting. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, since we're out here in the slot, and you brought up the topic of the threat to Grant's rear and his paranoia over it, uh, Doug Crosick. Is, has a question for us, Doug from okay. Kentucky. Uh, and he wants to know, was Johnston's army of relief realistically a viable force to relieve the siege? Not with Johnston in command. Um, Johnston, of course, has told Pemberton all along, get out of Vicksburg. He believes it's a trap. Uh, he sees it as nothing but a trap. And uh, Johnston doesn't want any part to do it. You know, I don't, I don't want uh, to hook my star to, you know, a shooting star or a falling star. And so he doesn't want anything to do with it. So, um, and I, I am not a fan of Joseph B. Johnson, never, never have been. Um, and I admittedly like to take some zings at him every chance I, I get. But uh, I think it's abundantly clear that Johnston's idea is that I'm going to do just enough to make it look like to everybody watching in posterity and history uh, that I tried. Um, but I'm not going to put any more effort in, into that, and I'm not going to ruin my reputation, you know, getting the blame that Vicksburg fell when I told the guy to get out of Vicksburg earlier, you know. Um, so you, you look at things like uh, twice Pemberton sent uh, Johnston messages of how long he could hold out, how long, and, and they have this stuff. I mean, they knew how much food was in Vicksburg, they knew at the amount that we're issuing it per day and how many troops and so on we're feeding, how long this stuff is going to last, you know, to, to, to last. Um, so Pemberton knew, and he sent him one day, he sent him, uh, I think it's, uh, we're going to be able to last 20 days. And then a few days later, we're going to be able to last 15 more days or, or whatever, whatever it was, uh, both of which calculate out to about July the 4th or 5th, 
which turns out, you know, that's when they ran out of the ready amount of, of food. Um, it's significant that Johnson doesn't begin his movement until about the third or fourth, um, most likely to, to not be in any position to, to, to aid it. And he actually tells Pemberton uh, that I will attack on the seventh, which is after the days that Pemberton had told him that I can, can realistically um, hold out. So um, Johnson is looking for an out. He's looking for a way to get out of this thing uh, without his reputation being tarnished. And so he's going to put forth just as much, just as, as little effort as we possibly can um, right at the tail end when we know Pemberton can't hold out anymore to make it look like we went and we tried, but we got news on the way that Pemberton had surrendered and, oh, we better head back to Jackson then. So um, not a fan of Johnston, never have been, but doing this book, um, this has been the first real in-depth work I've, I've done with Johnston and, and my opinion has only gone, gone down. So. Okay. I guess we'll be able to find out more about that opinion, uh, in some, in some future, in some future books. Uh, one of the things, uh, that people know me that know that I like is I like smaller conflicts and smaller battles and battles that are sort of hidden off. And, and so, uh, one of the things that, that you can learn in, in this book is this weak attempt by Johnston is not is certainly not a an attempt that results in no combat. There are things that happen. And uh, and so um, that's another reason to get this book and, and sort of dive in to that. Right. There are um, small skirmishes around here and there as, as they probe uh each other but um right not you guys a, that get shot a, there are just as shot as anybody else <laughs> they're just as dead as anybody else yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and then uh but then let's also jump into uh some of the operations that go on the battle the operations that result in battles that go on around the earthworks and we don't have a ton of time left so let's jump right into that to that okay. mine uh logan's approach in the mine and because that's probably one of the most compelling battle stories to come out of the siege. Right. Uh, yeah, um, McPherson's Corps, of course, McPherson's an engineer, uh, but he has his um, engineer officer, H Hickenlooper, Andrew Hickenlooper, who was at Shallow, you know, the battery commander, 5th Ohio battery commander at Shallow. Um, they, once they get to the, to the Confederate earthworks as close as they can get without, you know, digging them down or, or whatever, um, they've either got to go up and over or either start tunneling underneath. And so Hickenlooper begins this mine in, um, in mid-June, late uh, 22nd, 23rd or so. Uh, by the 25th, it's under the Confederate Redan held by the 3rd Louisiana, uh, which was known actually as Fort Hill. It's not Fort Hill at Vicksburg today is over on the river, or what used to be the river, and was not known as, as Fort Hill then. That's a Union earthwork known as Fort Hill. But... Um, the third Louisiana Redan, as it's described at, at, in the park today, uh, known as Fort Hill then, is blown up on June, the afternoon of June the, the 25th. And um, the Illinoisans, uh, 45th Illinois, 20th Illinois, begin to, to move through. And there's vicious fighting there for about 26 hours over possession of the, the crater. Uh, and a lot of it, of course, is just um, the, the new para parapet, this retrenchment that I talked about. Uh, the Confederates on one side, the Union forces on the other, and they're just holding muskets up over each other and over the parapet and, and firing and, and so on. So there's a, a death struggle there for a long time, hours and hours. Uh, and each side would, uh, the Confederates less so than the, the Federals, but each side would bring in new troops and, and replace uh, the different regiments and so on that were doing the firing over, over, um, over time. But it fails. Uh, but then, and this is actually the first time in American history American military history that a mine had been blown uh, underneath an enemy fortification. So it worked. It's very historic. Uh, pre, you know, if you ask anybody any Civil War buff on the street, probably when was the first mine exploded under an enemy earthwork? And they say Petersburg the crater, but no, it was Vicksburg on June the 25th. Uh, and then they do it again on July the 1st. There's an, another um, mine exploded on the 21st or on the 1st, and there are several others waiting to be exploded. Uh, but Grant's basically says okay hold off boys let's uh, 
let's don't explode any more by themselves uh, and let's get them all ready and for this grand assault that we're going to make on the 6th on july the 6th let's let's wait and explode all of them at the same time and and assault then and and do this thing once and for all mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah so that sort of illustrates that there you know the siege operations are not just the soldiers sitting and staring at each other oh every day there's somebody not. trying to do something including lots, like that lots going on a lot of skirmishing and sharpshooting and and uh uh, trading knives and canteens and everything. Uh, lots of interesting yeah. stuff going on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If you read the book, you're going to get a chance to learn about Coonskin and Coonskin's Tower. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, uh, that sharpshooting. Uh, yeah. Brian Steenbergen from Michigan has a question for us a, the, okay. on the lar a very large scale question. How aware was Grant regarding the events at Gettysburg? Did those events influence Grant's actions at all? Uh, not to the extent of influence and actions. I mean, by the time you get into early July, Grant has got his hands around Pemberton's throat and, you know, we're just going to wait this out until the 6th when everything's ready and we're going to gonna assault. So that, that doesn't really play a, a role in any of Grant's decisions. However, uh, there, as much as the folks in the East are watching what's going on in Vicksburg, the folks in Vicksburg are watching what's going on in the East and they know that Robert E. Lee has broken away and stolen a march on the Army of the Potomac and is entering Maryland and even Pennsylvania. Uh, they hear about uh, Hooker has been replaced by George Meade, and they know that the Army of the Potomac now is trailing and following up into, into Pennsylvania. And some even talk about, you know, the, 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 the uh, interesting thing now that we hear about um, Lee's invasion of Pennsylvania is that it was a great big raid. You know, it was it was uh, a raid up into Pennsylvania and brought back a lot of supplies and 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 all of that. Uh, and some even talked about this grand raid that the Confederates were making up into into Pennsylvania. So yes, they were watching. And it took a little while for news to to get here, of course. And they're three or four days behind, but they are ab absolutely watching what's going on. Um, with with bated breath to find out what happens in this confrontation and of course it's only you know way after the surrender that they hear the actual name gettysburg and find out that there was a big fight there and, and right. all that so things had already taken place by the time the actual news of gettysburg itself um, gets there but uh but they're watching very closely the the movements of the armies beforehand yeah our friend alan guthrie also a shiloh discussion group uh, mm -hmm. member has a has a question for us and it i think i just want to read uh, alan's question and if you can give us a brief response tim that would be that would be great but i but okay. I, what I want to do is uh get alan's question out there his thought alan wants to know there was talk of grant going down to port hudson to join with banks and that banks should go up to vicksburg to join with, with grant and he thinks that that's halleck you know fiddling with fiddling things here uh, all right Banks ranks Grant. Had Banks gone to Vicksburg, would he have been the hero of Vicksburg? Well, if if uh, it had turned out the way it did, which Banks is no Grant, of course. Um, mm -hmm. So whether it would have actually turned out under Banks's command the way it did under Grant's command is uh, is something we don't know. That's a, a counterfactual, of course. Uh, but had it turned out the same way, sure, Banks would have been the the um, the, the grant and probably would have been in line for the presidency. You know, he's a politician to, to begin with, but Grant yeah. realized this was not the, the way with it. We need to go. He's, he's, uh, you know, these orders that he gets from Halleck. Um, it's the, the funny story. He counts up. I can just see him on his fingers. How many days will it take to get word back to Washington that I'm not going down to Port Hudson, I'm going on to Vicksburg. And then how many days will it take to get back word to me? And, and so on. He said, I probably got a little over a week. He said, you can do a lot in eight days. So he, he goes after Vicksburg and kind of asked uh, uh, forgiveness more than, than permission. So, right. And it worked right. out well. Uh, Tim, we have about five more minutes of our scheduled time here, but I want to I wanted say that our customers really seem to be enjoying the program and we're getting some questions in here. I still have a few. If we went a few minutes longer, we do have time to stay on the call and chat. Sure. Certainly, absolutely. Okay, good. I want to make just want to make sure we're clear on that, uh, that I'm not keeping you from some something else. But you have a lot no, of people got, here that are having a good time. Chops coming, but uh, that's it. So 
some pork chops. Okay, we won't yeah. keep you for the pork chops, but we will. Uh, uh, we will do a few things and go a little bit long. Uh, David Wiegers, who is one of our regular uh, watchers of this program, and uh, and a real expert on uh, sculpture, especially Lincoln sculptures and, mm -hmm. and statues, um, has a comment that I want to that I want to share with everybody. Vicksburg's Kentucky Memorial has statues of Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis standing next to one, or one another. Nothing like it anywhere else in the country. Um, so I don't know, Tim, do you have a, that's like one of these questions about the park and I could, if we wanted to talk about the park, I could do that too. <laughs> yeah, um, well, that's a much more recent creation. Um, it was only put up just several years ago, I believe. And if I understand correctly, I believe the original artist wanted the J Davis and Lincoln shaking hands, but everybody said, "Oh no, we're not, we're not doing that." Right. Um, but uh, it, it obviously is trying to symbolize Kentucky and its role as a border state that it sent troops both ways, and and um, you know that it was the uh, the fatherland of both presidents, and and so on. So it's an interesting uh, interesting aspect of uh, of how it. Of, of Kentucky's role in, in Vicksburg. And I've heard, you know, some that really like it, some say it's the most farcical thing I've ever seen and, and so on. So, um, and you know, the fact that, that uh, well, Davis went to Vicksburg, of course, and, and actually no. Lincoln had been to Vicksburg uh, beforehand, but neither one actually on the battlefield at the time or, or afterwards or anything like that. Right, yeah, both, that, that's something that might surprise people, but you have to dig into the biographies of both men to, no, yeah, they were both at Vicksburg at one time. Yeah, yeah. Lincoln twice actually made two trips down yeah, there. Yeah, made two trips down there. And then River. Davis lived, uh, yeah. lived around there. I want to, so I want to take a question here, uh, a moment here. Uh, one thing that we often do during our programs is share things that you can get from Abraham Lincoln Bookshop uh, that are in addition to the books that we are featuring and might be uh instructive or valuable for understanding the battle and having something that understands the battle and one thing that i'm going to show you here is a book that's even bigger than tim's uh <laughs> book and this version of it is rebound uh this is not what it would look like originally but i'll show you the spine it's illinois at vicksburg and it is the report of the Illinois Commission at Vicksburg. And it's a wonderful book and it's voluminous. And, and certainly uh, the, an Illinoisan would tell you that Illinois' Vicksburg monument puts Kentucky to shame. <laughs> not because, not because of everybody. Lincoln and Davis, but because of the, the enormity of the Illinois Memorial. So. And we have this available, and you can you can see it on our website if you want to look into it. But Tim, for the purposes of illustrating uh, talking about this book, can you tell us about the important role of uh, of the state commissions in interpreting the battlefield park later, such as yeah. the Illinois Commission? Each uh, each state was allowed in the enabling legislation to enter into the boundaries of the park and to set up uh, memorials and, and monuments. And uh, just like at Shallow and Chickamauga and Gettysburg elsewhere, um, states did it in different ways. Uh, some would put up individual unit markers. Um, some would put up just tablets and uh, to their individual units. Some would just put up a, a state memorial. Um, some like Illinois uh, would put up all of the above almost, um, including equestrian monuments uh, to uh, McClernand and uh, mm -hmm. also Grant. And so uh, Illinois is, is far above and beyond everybody when it comes to Vicksburg. Um, and it has to do with some members of the commission. Uh, some are, are, you know, they're dealing with the railroads that run from Illinois. They're looking at getting, um, passengers, you know, to go from Illinois down to Vicksburg and what would eventually become the Illinois Central, um, the, the main line of mid-America as it, as it was known. Um, so the, the individual commissions have a lot of sway. Um, the, the park, the National Park Commission itself has the, 
the, the final authority, of course, but these individual state commissions at Shiloh or elsewhere um, have a lot of say in their individual, in the interpretation of their individual units and, and uh, regiments and so on. And so they do a whole lot of good work. And the reason the book Illinois Shiloh is so big, of course, is because Illinois had so many troops at Shiloh. They, they mm -hmm. just dwarf anybody else. Uh, Mississippi included, and uh, just tons and tons of troops and regiments at um, at Vicksburg, and uh, of course the the uh, Lincoln Library there in in Springfield is absolutely a treasure trove of of Vicksburg uh, material, and that's why in the bibliography there's so many collections of papers that are are accessed in um, in Springfield, and the folks at Springfield are just wonderful about uh, working with you and going through all of these these um, these uh, manuscript collections and so on. Yeah, it's a it's a uh, it's it's a great institution. And since you brought it up, I, I, I'm again so let's do a shout out to Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. And the folks watching may not appreciate that it's a museum and an archives. All right. So it, there's a place for you to go and see all the stuff, you know, all the museum and the artifacts and so on. But also, it's an invaluable resource for historians uh, to get in and get enormous amounts of access right. to enormous amounts of manuscript material. Yeah, I make about one trip a year or so up there, so mm -hmm. it's good. Hey, stuff. I have one other book I know I wanted to share, even though this is one reason why we went over time. You brought him up um, early in the program, and uh, of course, the late Edwin Cole Bars has to be recognized as the original 20th century historian of Vicksburg and perhaps the original, perhaps there's nobody before him that did anything as valuable. Not as, to that extent, certainly. As yeah. E.C. Bars. And so, the, but the book I'm, I'm, I'm gonna show you, I did show you and I'll show you again, is I pick it because it's one of the less known books and also a huge fat book. Uh, let's get a good look at uh, young Ed Bars there. Uh, there he was at the time he was historian at the Vicksburg National Military Park. But when he wrote Decision in Mississippi it, for the Mississippi Centennial Civil War Centennial Commission, he produced this enormous book that you can read from cover to cover, and he never quite, get, quite gets you to Vicksburg, does he? <laughs> yes. The whole our, our card. Or cards, yeah. Part. It's yeah. this enormous amount of research and wonderful writing that introduces you to all of these things that happened in, in Mississippi that weren't Vicksburg or Corinth. Now, I do not know, uh, I see no comment from the Vicksburg Mississippi Centennial Civil War Commission on what they thought of the fact that he didn't write anything about their biggest battles. But it's the most, it's just such a valuable book, Tim. Yeah. Um, they they, they I, lost both of those, so they don't want to hear about them, probably. <laughs> What's that? I said Mississippi lost both of those at Corinth and Vicksburg, so they probably don't want to hear yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, maybe they, they just didn't want to hear about it. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, there's so many, so many great little battles that uh, E.C. Bars uh, writes about in Decision in Mississippi, and it certainly establishes, uh, I think, and I think it establishes a line between his work and what you've done in these books in showing the importance of the stuff we haven't seen yet. Um, the, the importance of a small cavalry raid, the importance of an engineering project. Uh, and he writes extensively on these Mechanicsburg expeditions. Mm -hmm. And he, he helps us understand in, in this book and in the three volume study, uh, you know, what you referred to, Ballard referred to as Grant's paranoia. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's valuable. Good, good, uh, good, good book, good stuff on Iuka and Holly Springs raid and, and mm -hmm. uh, all of those. So. Yep. Yep. All right. I think, I think I am going to start wrapping it up here uh, for us, Tim, but I do want to, first of all, I want to do the shout outs to some of the people who have been watching and thank them. Uh, Thomas Hassel is watching from Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, Dave from the UK and Dave from Illinois, as usual, are both watching at the same time. Uh, Mike from Texas has been uh, watching and Jack hey, Bach. Tracy from Sterling, Virginia Wood. 
Ed from Podunk, Alabama. Uh, Kevin from Pocahontas, Iowa. Dan Madsen I was out there in Denver. Hello, Dan. Always good to see you. And then, of course, Dave is in Gurney. Uh, Dave Wiegers is in Gurney, Illinois. He asked us a question. Thank all. Thank you to all of you for uh, joining us. And uh, one last question for you, uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, did it work? What was it? Get Vicksburg? Oh yeah, he got he caught the <laughs> rabbit. Uh, he, uh, he he dug the Confederates out basically and uh, got Vicksburg. Although, um, you know, it's it's kind of interesting um, looking at expectations and reality, I guess, and, and so on. But Grant writes this wonderful letter to his father in like mid June, late latest June, June twenty second or or something like that. And uh, basically, by that time, it's a done deal. There, everybody knows what's what's going to happen. They know Johnson's not coming at this point, and and Grant's gotten all these reinforcements and so on. And so he, he tells everybody it's it's basically a matter of time. Uh, but he tells his father, I I wanted so much more of it than what's gonna what's gonna come from it. I wanted to do a whole lot more. I wanted a whole lot more to come from it. And uh, you know, he talks about it's too late in the year because of the dust and the heat and so on to, to make other expeditions into the interior of Mississippi and, and, and all that. And, and he basically says, if I had, had taken Vicksburg during the assaults, I could have done a, a whole lot more. And, um, and now I've, I'm not going to accomplish nearly what I, what I wanted to. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, put yourself in Lincoln's shoes sitting in Washington when he gets word of, of Vicksburg's capitulation. I, I think Link's, Lincoln's thinking, Good enough. I'm I'm satisfied that yeah. you did plenty. So, <laughs> but, but, yeah, but that, Grant's that's not good, then. That's a good Do point, I, Tim. The the most important Union victory in the war, um, Appomattox uh, accepted, of course. The most important Union victory of the war is not decisive. It's still going to go on. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, even the Mississippi River, you've got Port Hudson doesn't surrender till, and of course, it's dependent on Vicksburg, obviously. Right. And, and the biggest blow that's landed, you know, comes at Vicksburg uh, and couple that with Gettysburg, obviously, and it's a disastrous couple of days for the Confederacy. Um, you know, totter to our destruction, as, as um, he said. But, um, mm -hmm. but even that does not end the war, and it goes on two more years nearly. Yeah. Dave from the UK, Dave Bradley chimes in. Uh, he wants to know who the subject of the biography is, Tim. Oh, uh, well, you'd be interested in this, I guess, too. Um, yeah. I'm actually doing a, a uh, retreatment. It's not a full biography, but it is a re-examination of the war years and the war in the West of Albert Sidney Johnson. So, oh, uh, yes. We're working on Albert Sidney Johnson. Excellent. Excellent. Oh. We're going to have to sell that book and talk about it when that comes out, because I know everybody that's watching now is going to want to buy a signed copy of that book. Shallow folks. All right, everybody. Yeah. Let's wrap this up. Uh, so thanks again for watching, and we will see you next time on A House Divided.